You always have to look out, cast yes. a wide net, look and see who else is there, where else are people coming from? And that's how you bring together diverse ideas. When you're bringing diverse people together, you've got a stronger company. Follow the Leader features dynamic women entrepreneurs in their journeys to becoming a success in business. This podcast is an inspirational space for entrepreneurs, future entrepreneurs, and thought leaders as they share their keys to success. I am Chanel Christoph Davis, the CEO and founding partner of the largest woman and minority-owned sales tax advisory practice in the country, Davis Davis and Harmon, LLC. So today I'm so excited to welcome to the show our guest leader, Jolene Risch. Jolene uses her 20 years of experience in human resources to lead a national recruiting firm that specializes in identification of top talent to help shape growing businesses. Risch results, a certified women business enterprise, recruits and places outstanding individuals into positions of accounting, finance, sales, marketing, HR, and operations. Recent clients including companies in construction, technology, service, healthcare, manufacturing, distribution, you're all over the place. Rich <laughs> Results is you can recruit your um, recruit people for multiple positions across industries. She's a graduate of Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses, and it's an intensive program that I was also, I'm alumni, I'm cohort too. Um, yeah. Yeah, and she's currently enrolled in Kellogg's Nonprofit Board Member Institute, which is exciting when I learn more about Actually that. Actually graduated. Oh, oh, you graduated already? Nice. Yeah. Jolene also serves her profession in her community on the Dream Team Professional Women's Network, where she's founder and president, Go Diva. And she's also a part of the Executive Search Owners Association. She's an active board member of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum and is a chair of WINGS Dallas 2020 Mentors and Allies Awards Luncheon. So welcome to the show, Jolene. We're so happy to have you. Yay! Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So the reason why I really want to have you on the show is because I am so inspired by all of the work you do in the world of philanthropy. You do a lot of work with the Dallas, um, I, I just said the Holocaust Museum and Human mm -hmm. Rights Museum. Mm -hmm. um, and you're very, very active in wings. So I just thought you'd be fabulous to, to give us a perspective of, you know, how do you balance working your um, entrepreneur, entrepreneur initiatives as well as balancing it with your world of philanthropy. We'll, we'll get there. So okay. take us take us to the, from, the, from the beginning. How did you get into the world of HR, human resources? Yeah. Um, all right. It started with a book I read in high school. Okay. This book by James A. Michener. You've, you know James A. Michener read all these interesting stories. And the book was called The Drifters. And it was about a group of young adults traveling together. And what was so interesting to me was how they interacted at different points along their travels. I was just fascinated by group dynamics. Mm. And my college essay was on that book. And my fascination with people in groups. I was 17 when I wrote wow. this essay. I know. And I ended up majoring in sociology, minored in education. Um, I was in the Peace Corps for a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, so right after college, I, I taught for a year waiting to get placed into a country. And I was in the Peace Corps for a few years. And it was there that I started exploring more about what this is, what this whole group dynamics is and why I'm so interested in it. And I remember um, I came home on a break and went to the bookstore and I saw this book about organizational psychology. Mm. And I said, that's it, that, that's what I wanna study. And so when I finished the Peace Corps, I got a master's in organizational psychology from Columbia in New York and then worked at EY in their people division. Mm -hmm. So wasn't the human resource group really, but we were working with um, just all, you know, organizational behavior and training management and a lot of performance management. And EY was like a whole nother education for me. I mean, it was so fascinating and they were such a great company to work for. 
always supportive of me and building a family. I mean, I had, I had my second son um, while first and second son while I was at EY. And Mm -hmm. when my second son was about three years old, I decided to take a leave of absence And instead of going back after about a year, I decided to start exploring what I wanted to do on my own. Interesting. So were you always an entrepreneur by heart? Were you, did you always know that you would do something in entrepreneurship or did it just come out of necessity because you wanted to be home with your kids? Yeah, I think, I I mean, I definitely didn't know I wanted to do something on my own. Um, And I still, it's funny, I still really like the idea of, of doing things in groups, Mm. right? I mean, you know, if a partner came to me tomorrow and said, let's do this together, and we had similar visions, I'd be like, sure, let's do it. You know, Um, I, I didn't know that I kind of fell into it. I knew I wanted to work with business owners, and kind of just fell into this whole recruiting thing. Um, and realize, wow, there's, I mean, cause I didn't do recruiting at EY. Right. I you weren't, did a you lot weren't of on the interview. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. We, I mean, we interviewed people, managers always have to interview people coming in. I didn't do any recruiting per se. I just kind of fell into the recruiting thing when I wanted to go into a business and help groups work effectively together. But what people were asking me for was, okay, but I need to find this person. I need to find the people first. <laughs> I need I the person, talent. And then we'll talk about how they can work together. That's funny. how I fell into the whole recruiting thing. That's interesting because at EY is one of the largest, probably big four, one of the largest recruiting uh, all, I mean, businesses in the world. They constantly recruit talent. So you didn't even, you didn't even do that when you were in big four at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. No, no, I was in there. People that, you know, I was hired there right around, you know, Y2K. So they were hiring a lot of people. And the whole idea was, you know, you got process and technology and then yes, you need to- I remember. Dress, right? The people areas um, when you're going through big changes. So that's what I was hired for. Yeah. And so how long have you been, how, when did you start Reich Results? I love the name. Reich Results, Results officially was started 14 years ago. So I kind of played around with exactly, you know, what I wanted to do and how I was going to do this. But it was about 14, 15 years ago when I remember going to a friend, my friend, Debbie Romick, who had started a business. And I said, well, okay, this is what I want to do, but I don't know how to tell people. Like, now what? Like, do I stand on a mountaintop? Yeah. How do I get the word out? (laughs) Like, what do I do? And she brought me to a networking meeting and that was it. That was kind of how That's it all. That's when the light bulb, yeah. That's a <laughs> light bulb moment. When you walk in, you're like, oh, so this is how people drum up business. I get yeah. it. I know. Yeah. I was like, I have no idea how to tell people what I want to do. And that's how it started. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's definitely a different um, a different world when you're on an on entrepreneurship route. Yeah. Route. Exactly. Yeah. It's a different, different group of people, places, things. It's, it's a whole new language. It definitely is. And it's an amazing community. It's an yes. incredible community. So how yeah. long have you been certified with um, WBE? I think this is, I'm on year six. This I think okay. this is year six. I think I just became certified again for year six. Yeah. Well, you've been certified longer than me. I, I've, I've, we got our, our certification probably 2017. So probably it was right, right after you got yeah. certified. Yeah. 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 I start, so I went through a divorce in 2014 and had to kind of start over my business and rethink everything. And sometimes those moments are like the best for really knowing how you want to do something. And we kind of changed how I was, you know, doing the whole recruiting thing. And also I knew then that I wanted to be with more women who were Mm. like me, you know? Okay. And so that was one of my thoughts, like, oh, I'm going to meet a lot more women business owners. You know, let me let me join this group. And it's also so neat to be identified as a woman owned business. Yes. I mean, I, I was so proud of that, you know, just the whole process. It, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it definitely. is a neat group, very supportive group as well. And you also did a stint. What now? What cohort are you in? Were you in for Goldman? Sachs? Lucky thirteen. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, you guys love saying that. That's so funny. Lucky thirteen. <laughs> <You're very laughs> yeah. lucky. How was that experience for you? Uh, it was great. I mean, I had learned about Goldman Sachs when my friend had gone through cohort four. Okay. And she said, Jolene, why aren't you here? This is you. Like, you need to be you here. So, right you will eat this up. Yeah. Yeah. This is your people and it's going to do, but it was really kind of the wrong time for me. I mean, just personally, I just didn't think I could, could really devote all of me. And um, yeah, so I, I did it in 2018 and I mean, it was so inspiring. I, I, I was just on a panel a couple days ago, last Friday with the women in construction and they were asking me as questions about it and, and what you got out of it. And there's a lot of great things. Entrepreneurs. Yeah, there's a lot of tangibles and intangibles. Well, for me, the intangible was the fire in my belly. Mm, so yeah. I like got out of there, like, let's go, let's yeah. do this enough. Let's go. I mean, I was like so inspired. Yeah. So I, I will definitely put a link in the in the show notes about Goldman Sachs, 10,000 small businesses. We we're talking like the audience knows what we're talking about. What Goldman Sachs is a, an entrepreneurship um, cohort model, intensive educational um, program. It's a free program. And um, Goldman Sachs, um, the corporation has a foundation that, that funds this actual initiative. And the initiative was to get to 10,000 small businesses in the United States of America. I think they've surpassed 10,000 mm -hmm. and yeah. they're still going. So I don't know yeah, how, that's how that's going to work. Yeah. Um, but the goal initially was to get to 10,000 entrepreneurs. And the whole purpose is to basically kind of build um, a whole force of, of entrepreneurs that can kind of almost be a lobby. You know, we can kind of put our voices together to lobby Congress. We can, you know, um, learn from each other, network with each other. It kind of gives you a village. One of the things about entrepreneurship, I think that's very difficult. It can be very lonely, yeah. especially if you're a solo entrepreneur and you're, you don't have a business partner. So uh, Goldman Sachs is a great way to have interaction and relationship with peers and people who know what you're going through, who's been what you've been through, what you're going through, um, can lend you like a helping hand and, and advice. It's just a really, really strong program. So if you guys are interested, the listeners, I will definitely put the, the um, notes in the show notes to give you links to how you can find more yeah. about the program. Something else to note about the program, which is really impressive, is Babson College wrote all the material, all yes. the modules for Goldman Sachs. Babson is the number one school university in the country for entrepreneurship. I mean, yes. Babson, I actually visited there with my eldest son when we were visiting schools in the Boston area. It's the most beautiful, gorgeous campus in Wellesley. Is it really? Wow. Oh, it is so pretty. I mean, it's just quintessential New England, gorgeous campus. They developed all the material, all the modules. Yeah, I believe they're the first college university in the country to even have an entrepreneurship uh, discipline or educational program. So yeah, they created all the curriculum. So it's, it's a real, I highly recommend it. Me too. Um, I, was, I was part of cohort th two. Was I a part of two? I think I was a part of cohort two. So when it first came to Dallas. So that's incredible. How did you find out about it? Actually, a good friend of mine was in cohort one in wow. the same conversation that your friend had with you was why aren't you why you know, she felt like she wasn't really able to get all of the good information out of it to benefit her business. She felt like she was kind of in this weird transition period where she just wasn't her head wasn't in the game. Yeah. But she said, you absolutely will thrive in this program. You should yeah. be here. And it's funny, the story, the funny story about it is I, I live in the outskirts, outskirts of Dallas, far outskirts of Dallas. And the, the program is in the community college in Dallas, downtown, like the heart of Dallas. So it's going to be, it was going to be a serious commute for me. So I was like, why would I do this? I already have a business. Why would I go learn about starting a business? I have a degree in accounting. Ah, I don't want to do this. You know, I have like two degrees, accounting and management. I don't want to do this. And she was like, Chanel, just trust me, interview. So I went and interviewed. And of course, if I sign up to do anything, I got to do it the best. I had to do it with excellence. So I couldn't just flub the interview. So I gave my best interview. Still didn't want to do it. 
got into the class really literally was the best decision I've ever made. It, yeah. it has definitely, um, I mean, I've had some significant trigger points in my business. We've been in business for 20 years and I've had several pivot points along our, our journey of being entrepreneurs. And that was one of them for sure. Yeah. yeah. It definitely my pushed only you on the, regret, on the fast track. My only regret is I didn't do it sooner. Honestly. Oh yeah, yeah. And I would come home and and wear my husband out. I'll be like, okay, we learned this today, and we got to do this. And tomorrow when we start, we got to make sure we do this. And then he's like, oh my god. <laughs> I was like, it was like coming at him so fast. But yeah, like every class was just s such a amazing, intensive of information. It was just a, one of the best experiences I've ever had. Post, you know, college age, it was it was mm -hmm, exceptional. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me about your work in. Uh, with the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Yeah, that's an amazing museum. Have you been? I've never, been. you know, I wanted to go, but then COVID, so I haven't been. Yeah, so. it's okay. You tell me when and I'm gonna take you there because okay. they're actually open, not today because of the weather, but they're actually open for smaller groups. Okay, so you can um, go so with a small group. Go, we could go tomorrow, we could bring your family, we can go whenever you want and we can okay. have a tour through. But here's the amazing thing about the Holocaust Museum. So. The Holocaust Museum actually was founded 50 years ago okay. um, by a group of Holocaust survivors who said, we can't forget this. There are too many lessons that wow. we need to continue to teach people that you can learn from the Holocaust. And so until 2019, it was the Ho Dallas Holocaust Museum. Okay. And it was actually in a building right across the street from the current Holocaust Museum and very, very small museum, really small museum. And they brought in at least 50, 60,000 students, school kids a year through the museum. I mean, they got, Basically, about 80, 90,000 people would get through that museum every single year. Mm. More than half of them were school children. Because the whole idea is, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, bias and prejudice and how to be an upstander in your community, this can be learned. This, right. you know, I mean, we can learn we introduced that. early. Mm -hmm. we but we have to introduce it early. Exactly. So, the idea was we want to build a bigger museum to impact even more people, more kids, more kids. And then they kind of expanded the mission. They, they kind of expanded the mission to be about using the Holocaust to teach the community about bias and being an upstander and, and prejudice and all of that. But what the museum became, what's so interesting is that, it became a museum that everyone can relate to. Everyone, mm -hmm. doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter you know, what your background is, what your religion is, doesn't matter, you, can, you will be able to relate to it. The first part of the museum, you go through your learning about the Holocaust and how that happened. How did that come about? Even, I mean, you yeah, know- How did it to, start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and they talk about that, that the the hate and the and the misinformation misinformation that fueled the hate they talk about that and how easily that can happen and now we see that all the time on social media i mean can you imagine like in the 1930s they're you know they're printing these lies about about jews right well mm -hmm. you know that was just going around you know communities and look what happened 6 million jews were killed right right now i mean hate is just like with social media. It's so readily accessible now. It's so scary. You start there. And what's amazing about the museum is after you learn about the Holocaust and what happened, then we start talking about human rights in general. Mm. Um, and then we go into this room called the genocide room. The genocide room is a room that says, well, look, did we really learn our lesson when we after the Holocaust, after killing 6 million people, did we really learn our lesson? Because the genocide room is showing genocides all over the world. Oh, wow. That happened after Post. the Holocaust. Okay, gotcha. Rwanda. Rwanda. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the fact, Sudan. Sudan. I mean, it's just really... It, it's real. It's really scary. And then after that, it, there's a um, an area about America and what's gone on in America, civil rights. In fact, right now there's um, a temporary 
exhibit on civil rights in the South. Mm -hmm. And we got to get there, Chanel, before May, because it's, I think they're closing the that temporary exhibit before May. There's always an, a part about civil rights in the main museum, but there's specifically a part that's talking about civil rights in the South. And okay. Yeah, it's okay. An amazing I definitely movie. want to take my daughter. Yeah. 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 She Your daughter. Yeah. I mean, the kids start going in, you know, seventh, eighth grade to learn about it. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I can absolutely tell that this is a passion of yours. Your whole face changed, your whole body language changed when you started talking about the Holocaust Museum. How did you get involved? So I come from a family who only two generations ago lost way too many family members as a result of, of the Holocaust. Um, and like I said before, as a result of misinformation, just spreading and creating hatred. And that, you know, and while that was happening, communities and, and, people just standing by. And that's why the whole idea of being an upstander in your community is so important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and because of my family background, um, my history, I mean, that's really how I became involved in that's the your, That's yeah. your personal tie. Yeah. That's my personal tie. But honestly, like that's how I became involved in the museum. But that background, my, my, you know, who I am and where I'm from and what my family has been through. I mean, that's what fuels me in everything I do. Mm. You know, my business, how I raise my kids. I love everything. it. I mean, that's, that, that is my why. If my family could make it to the United States and get through that, I owe it to my family and generations to come to say, wait, you know, no more, not again. Yes. I think that's one of the most powerful things. I think entrepreneurship affords you a lot of opportunities. Um, and it's, it, it's very difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> in all, in all, you know, to be honest, but one thing that one, one of the things that is amazing about entrepreneurship is that it affords you the chance to really impact communities. You know, you use, you can, you, I mean, you can do it some somewhat in corporate environments, but there's some limits, but when you have your own business and you lead your own enterprise, you really can lean in and really advocate for things that you care about. So that, yeah. that, that is one of the reasons why I wanted you on the show, because you, it's such, you do such a great job of mixing both. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I mean, um, is that intentional? So, was it intentional? Well, I'm. I've always been, as I mentioned, really interested in how diverse teams work together effectively. Right. I mean, that's yes. always been an interest. You know, I was the kid who was people watching. I'm, I'm really a much better like watcher and listener <laughs> yes. than almost anything else. I'm not, I'm, I don't know. Some people may say I'm talkative, but really I just love seeing how people interact, especially when they come together with different ideas and from different backgrounds and from different religions and cultures and everything. Right. And so that's always been inspirational to me. And to think that I can impact groups in my work, let me try, let me see. I mean, so even in our process, even when we're recruiting, our process is such that we're not going to be satisfied with looking at just our network, you know, the schools we went to and, and the database that I've collected, you know, over a million resumes for however many years. No, you can't be satisfied with that. You always have to look out, cast yes. a wide net, look and see who else is there, where else are people coming from? And that's how you bring together diverse ideas. And there's so much information out there now that shows that when you're bringing diverse people together, you've got a stronger company, you've got a more productive company, you've got a company that's going further, but it's taken us, it takes a really, really strong, brave <laughs> leader to feel comfortable to bring together people who, you know, don't really think like you. Don't that's think scary. like you, yeah. I mean, haven't you had people in your organization, you're like, okay, what is that idea you've come up with? Because that's weird to me. And your first thought is like, to reject nah, it. No, yeah. no, 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 I'm the boss. We're not going that way. <laughs> yeah. right? No, absolutely. Yeah. Diversity is, is, is definitely, it's been studied and they say that they're, the teams that are more diverse make more money. They're more profitable. So 
So yeah. what, are, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in, in HR recruiting? So for, I mean, we've had an, an incredible year. We will be remiss to not bring it up. 2020 was like, I don't even know what that was all about. Literally, we're still trying to unpack it. Um, civil unrest was at an all time high. Um, what changes are, is any of that filtering down to what you do? And how, how so is much. it filtering down? Tell so me. So much. Oh, gosh. I mean, it's in some ways it's, it was just like so many difficult times we learned from them. On top of, I, everything was just piling on top of each other. Right. And why does it have to take these vicious moments to be able to learn from them? Right. But I mean, I am not kidding that within a few weeks of George Floyd, his murder, I'm not kidding. There were people, leaders that I would speak to who would say, when they talked to me about what kind of person that they needed, I need a controller, I need a COO, or I need this, or I need that, but I don't want them to look like me. Oh, wow. So interesting. I mean, it's fascinating. And you had never heard that before. I'd never heard people say it in those terms. Now, what we know that diversity comes in all forms, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can look just like someone else and they can think totally different than I can and we can look totally different and we can think of a lot the same. I mean, you never know. But I thought it was so interesting that people were saying, I, I do want different people. I do want to bring in different ideas and people who come from different cultures and backgrounds than I do. And so I was definitely seeing that. I was also seeing companies that were looking in and saying, what can we do? Wow. What do, what can we do? I did an interview. So one of my goals um, is to be, be like you and, ah, you're so cute. You're <laughs> and so start sweet. learning from people in the same way that, that you do. And so I've started doing some interviews. And what I want to do, my goal for the interviews is not to talk as much about recruiting and all that. I want to talk about what's going on in the recruiting industry in the end, which is there's a lot of bias. There's a lot of bias in recruiting, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. in studies, if your name is this, people aren't going to choose yes. whatever, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I've talked, so I've talked to some different people about it. And there was one company um, I spoke with their CEO who, right, again, right after George Floyd said, you know, we need to do something. Okay. We've got to do something. But he didn't say, I have the solutions. He said, okay, I need you to help me. He looked at his company and said, let's, let's, let's come together. Let's, let's find some solutions. Let's be a better company. What can we do? And they did. They came, I mean, there's this presentation that he, that his people created and they're basically, you know, on a, on a journey to become a more inclusive Interesting. culture. So Their now, leader said, I know we can do more. So now I'm, I do have concerns. Tell me. Do you think that this is a temporary awakening? Or do you think that this is going to stick? Look, I mean, you're talking to someone who regularly has is, is seeing the rise of anti-Semitism yes. in our world. I mean, so trust me, I don't know if this will stick, but there is a, I mean, we know it. I mean, we can, I mean, even just in the past month, I mean, I think people are wanting change. I don't mm -hmm. think people always know how to get there. How to get there. And that's why I feel so strongly about the museum because all the museum is doing is educating. It's They're opening your eyes. There. Mm -hmm. So you, what you guys need to do is I do appreciate the focus on children. I think you need to keep that focus, but you're going to have to start bringing in corporations too. Oh yeah. No, we are. You have to. Yes. Uh, we are. Cinemark movie theater is the sponsor of the most beautiful theater within the museum. It's oh, wow. That's where okay. the opening. Oh yeah. No, there's lots of corporations that are getting involved. Love. And, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. It's, it's tough. You know, it's, it's, it's tough to open the whole community's eyes to something. But I will tell you, the opening of the museum was the fall of 2019. 
And it's a beautiful, beautiful building. It's gorgeous. It was, I mean, I can't even say standing room only. It was like, you know, you could barely like move. There were so many people from so many organizations, schools, every, I mean, there was just the whole community was there to celebrate the opening of the museum. And where is it located for people who want to know? (laughs) <laughs> it's located probably about 10 minutes from Goldman Sachs, where we had um, at the community college. It's on Record Street. Okay. It's on, on Record Street. Yeah. So in the heart of downtown Dallas. Heart of downtown Dallas, right near the Sixth Floor Museum. Okay. Uh, it's actually, it's it's kind of exciting because the Dallas Tourist Bureau lists it as one of their top tourist destinations in Dallas. So Interesting. You know, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So tell me, what are you excited about for 2021? I think we started having this conversation before we started recording. So tell me, what did you learn from 2020 and what are you excited about for 2021? Oh, so much. Um, I mean, 2020, because it was such a, a challenging year, I mean, just as what I said before, I mean, when you're going through challenging times, it just makes you stronger. And in so many aspects of my life, I just saw great things come out of 2020. So I was mentioning to you that my son was supposed to be in Singapore for the semester and he gets sent home. And my other son, who was a freshman in college, he gets sent home. You know, they're like, what is this? What is going on? Mm -hmm. We had more time together that I would not have had with my kids right? I mean, two of my sons already out the door. I had all this incredible time with them. And then my team, I mean, I just have the most wonderful, incredible work team. There's six of us. Mm. And second quarter, I mean, we didn't have any sales. We, you know, our revenue dropped uh, 55, 60%. And nobody lost any hope. I mean, my team, my team was like, you know, just, one day after another, what can we do? What should we do? We came up with some ideas of how to help companies in ways that we hadn't helped companies before. In the end, honestly, it went right back to what we do best, which is finding great talent. In third and fourth quarter, we made up for what we lost in second quarter. Oh, awesome. And, yeah, and we ended the year basically the same as the year before. That's amazing. So, Yeah. And so how can I not come out of that thinking, wow, this is an amazing year. That's dope. So what, what are you excited about for in 2021, 2021? Yeah, I would say more of the same, definitely more, more growth. Um, My team has really come together in solidifying the process that works best for, for finding really, really good people. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about some of my just my personal goals in, in the community, um, involvement in, you know, some different organizations and continued involvement in, in the museum. Um, my kids, you know, just excited about, you know, just different things going on with them. My son, my oldest son, he's graduating in May and he is going to be working at EY starting in August. Oh, so following his kind of mom's fun. footsteps. Love. Yeah. Kind of fun. He's, he, that kid is like a step above. I mean, I, he's just so mature and he's in a, um, he's in the consulting group and specifically in the financial services industry. Okay. So um, he's fun. Great. Yeah. Awesome. So lots of good stuff coming up. And, and I think that's the thing. I mean, I feel very fortunate. I'm very grateful for everything that's you know, going on, even if there's been, you know, challenging times in my life or in a, in 2020 or all that, I mean, what's to complain about? Right. You know? we're, we're very fortunate. So if you, if someone's listening to this show that is an uh, aspiring entrepreneur, maybe, you know, they lost their, their job and they decided, Hey, I'm gonna take this time to try to explore something new, similar to what you did, right? You, you yeah. just left EY and, decided that you're going to try to do it on your own, what advice would you give to them? Uh, Go to Goldman Sachs, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you have to have two years before you get in Goldman Sachs. Yeah, that's true. You can't go to Goldman Sachs. Okay. You need some time. What I would say is don't minimize your abilities to do something. 
you know, it's all, I think it's all um, a friend of mine, Holly Kaplan, she has this program about finding your purpose, right? Mm. And I think it's important to really look and see look in and say, okay, well, what is my purpose? What do I have to offer people, companies, groups? What do I have that I can real, you know, help other organizations or, or, you know, whoever. And I think once you figure that out, don't undermine what you think you can do, because really it, it's all up here, isn't it? It is yes. for me. I mean, yes. for me, it's all my mind. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, it's, you can do whatever you want to do. You put your mind to. But I think it is important to know your why. You have to kind of figure out what your why yeah. is because when times get hard and, you know, stuff is not clicking, things are not working, you have to go back to your why to, to want to keep pushing forward. What's your why? It changed. It changes. Um, I think yeah. my first why was I worked in Big Four you know, at the time was big six and um, left and transitioned, went to Verizon and did internal audit. And I realized that, you know, corporate wasn't for me. You know, I was the person that was always trying to, you know, put together. I was trying to put together employee resource groups before that was even a thing. Well, like yeah. I was literally having folk meet me at, you know, restaurants talking about, okay, we need to get together as a team and come up with a, you know, initiative for African Americans at uh Pricewaterhouse Coopers. It was like, what? <laughs> like, you know? So that was me my whole entire life trying to organize and and, you know, create the environment and create the world that I wanted to live in. I was always desperate to find a place where um and create the the business that i wanted to operate in my dream was to be a partner the first african-american partner in the dallas office for, for price waterhouse coopers that didn't happen but hey i'm a partner of my own accounting firm so that's to me that's even better right yeah but i think mm -hmm. i've always been um a person that wanted to orchestrate and and kind of create my own uh world you know yeah. the world i wanted to see and yeah. um, so I think entrepreneurship allows me to do that. Yeah. And you really created your world. I mean, you it's not like there's another one of, of a firm like yours in the world. So, I mean. Absolutely. And we're able to give other uh, young folk who maybe would not have an opportunity in this, this line of work and, and have a career in accounting and tax. We're providing career opportunities. I mean, it, it really is a dream. It is. So that's, that's my why. Yeah. Yeah. That's what there's, um, there's a group of um, students at Tulane who I work with and they started an app or a, a platform so when COVID hit, all these college kids who had these really cool internships, you know, they all fell through. And these two kids were like, okay, well, now what? We got to do something, we right? Do something, yeah. We got to put something on our resume to be able to, you know, get a job after college. So they created a platform bringing together businesses with students, but in a totally different way than traditional internships. Their idea was like, okay, so businesses don't have time to deal with a whole internship and babysitting someone. It's COVID time. They're busy. Stressed they out. Still, yes. They still have projects to get done. And so their whole platform is, is putting students in projects that businesses, mostly small businesses need to get oh done. Oh my gosh. What's the app? It's called um, risestudent.com. Oh Rise my gosh, Student that's com. phenomenal. It's, it's brilliant. And their whole why is we still need experience. We, we, have, to, still we have to put something on our resume. Right. I love that. And it was okay, but we can do it in a different way. And there they are. Well, I mean, you, don't you don't have that on your resume, on your bio, ma'am. You don't say that you were working with students from Tulane on your, on your bio. How was yeah. I supposed to know that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't put everything in there, right? No, you, you, you can. I can. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah, pretty cool. Pretty That's good. pretty cool. Yeah. No, it's really fun. It's really fun. Yeah. And so, how are you helping them with their their app development? What are you doing? You're consulting with them on. You know, it started with um, they were telling some people about their platform, and my son Eli, who's at Tulane, said, "You know, you ought to talk to my mom because that sounds a lot like recruiting." So we got on the phone and they started telling me about it. And I said, yeah, so, you know, you find all these great candidates as students 
And sometimes the challenging part, which, you know, is challenging for recruiters is finding the business. The best business. And we started talking about, well, how are you going to find these businesses? What are you going to do? And they started networking like, like, I mean, incredible. These kids, these, they, you know, they're juniors now they're going to networking meetings with, you know, business people. And I love it. They're entrepreneurs. They found a problem and they created a solution. That's how it starts. That's how it starts. So you have, go ahead. You know, I was going to say sometimes as we get older and we've been in corporations and we've been in organizations, that's when our mind becomes kind of like, you know, thinking thoughts that we shouldn't be thinking. And then you think about these young people who are like, there's a problem. There's a solution. I'm going to make it better and make it better. I'm going to create the solution. Exactly. We got to be like young people where we don't know if there's anything that's stopping us. You know, we have so much confidence. Right. Absolutely. That's what I would tell women or men who want to start their own thing. You know, just don't think about the limits. Yes. Try to think about the opportunity and think about Do you have a, a unique solution to a problem? If you if you have identified it, probably a lot of people have identified that issue, too. Mm-hmm. So you didn't share your why. What's your why? No, I, we talked a little bit about it. I mean, my why is 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 based on my family background, and, mm. and that's why uh, you became an entrepreneur. I became an entrepreneur because it gives me, like you said, the opportunity to bring together these aspects of my life. So, if creating communities with more diversity and with more upstanders and with less bias is important to me. How can I do that? Well, I certainly can do it if I can create my own business, you know, right? I mean, if I have my own business, I just like you said, I mean, there's so there's so many things that we can do. And so really where I come from, who I come from, my family, I mean, that is my why in how I raise my kids. That's my why in in how I ultimately want to help companies build better teams. And that's my why in anything I do in the, in the community. I love it. All right. Well, thank you, Jolene. This was lovely. Thank you, Chanel. Thank you. Such a wonderful um, conversation. Um, I really enjoyed it. And again, I I see your heart when I see you out in the community. Well, before COVID, (laughs) when I used to see you out in the community, (laughs) I never knew what you studied, but I can, talking to you and listening to you, your whole background and how you, you know, engage and network in the community. I totally see it now. Like you're such a, um, a touch point, like you're very engaging. You, when you, when someone talks to you, you feel as though there's no one else in the room. You have a, you have a unique ability to kind of everything else falls back and it's just me and you we're, we're in the zone so that's why I knew you, I had to have you on the show because I knew you was going to contribute something I amazing it. I especially appreciate you letting me talk about you know organizations that are meaningful to me I mean I absolutely really that that's what that's where you shine I'm, I knew you were going to come out and, and give it to us so thank you for sharing <laughs> I appreciate it Jolene absolutely you give me a date and your family, your office. Seriously, tell me when and we'll go on a tour. I love it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Chanel. You can find all of our past episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and Google, or any of your other favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to subscribe to the show, rate, and leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. Thank you for listening.